welcome again to Dimitri Live. My name is Maria Bambalis. I am a climate change educator, researcher, a facilitator. And I also, I like to put this up front, I'm also Dimitri's cousin. So, uh, so again, I have a, a good sense of Dimitri and it's really fantastic to be able to be supporting him um, in his campaign. I wanted to get started today with a land acknowledgement. I wanna start by acknowledging that I'm situated today on the customary and traditional lands of the indigenous and Métis peoples of the, Métis and Inuit peoples of the territories in which we reside and are participating from today. And I know that's different places for all of you who may be tuning in. I'm participating from the traditional territory of the Huron, the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I'm bound today by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee allied nations to peaceably share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. This place is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and is covered by Treaty 13 and the Williams Treaty. I recognize again that dependent on where you are located, you are on the traditional territories of diverse nations. I respectfully recognize the presence of Indigenous peoples, both in the past and the present, as I commit to action, education, meaningful dialogue and necessary change. It is important to acknowledge the lands from which I sit today. It's important for me to acknowledge that as I sit on these lands to discuss the consequences of current events in these times, that I recognize the historical impact and multi-generational effects that residential schools, oppressive laws and broken treaties have had on indigenous peoples. In particular, as we focus today on a shift to regenerative economic models in our conversation, it's important to acknowledge the violent and devastating impacts of historical and current competitive and extractive economic paradigms on the land and Indigenous peoples and their way of life. I recognize my ongoing responsibilities to act in solidarity to support Indigenous sovereignty over their traditional territories and ways of life and to restore land unjustly taken. I offer my gratitude for their care of and teachings about our earth and our relations. May I continue to grow in my ability to honor those teachings. So uh, Dimitri, um, I did want to mention actually before we get started that today we actually are not going to have a Q&A or a chat. We are going to post some things in the chat. And the reason for that is because um, Dr. Peter Victor is, has so much to offer us today and, and we know we barely are going to have enough time to scratch the surface. And we didn't want to be disingenuous about being able to answer questions because I think there's a lot to unpack about his economic model and vision that, that offers us a lot in these times as we think about recovery post-COVID. Um, so I just did want to let everyone know that. Um, Dimitri, last night, um, again, just amazed by the intensity of a campaign, but last night you participated in the Rabble Foreign Policy debate, um, which was viewed, we just, we just learned, has been viewed by over 4,000 people. Um, so, you know, that was a really interesting experience, and I wondered if you wanted to share about your reflections on, on, on that. Uh, first, let me say that I am coming uh, to everybody today from the unceded territory of the Gananyahaga Nation in what is now called Old Montreal, and I'm privileged to live and reside on this land of which uh, the Gananyahaga people are the true custodians. Uh, I have another an, a personal acknowledgement also to offer, and that is uh, an acknowledgement to you, Maria, uh, my cousin who has in so many ways been an inspiration and a spiritual guide to me. And if, if one could simplify the personal evolution that I've gone through over the last 30 years as learning from uh, all the things that you've had to offer uh, to me in terms of your incredibly sensitive understanding of human nature and, uh, and, 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 and the role that uh, colonialism and uh, imperialism and an inhumane capital system have played in uh, oppressing the most vulnerable members of our society. I cannot say strongly enough how much you've enriched my life and my understanding of these uh, critically important topics. So it's a privilege to have your support in this campaign and just generally, as I have had for many years. Thank you. Thank um, you. So in terms Thank of- you. And I just wanna welcome Peter that you're here. Um, we're gonna get to introducing you in just a moment. We're just having a little conversation about last night's foreign policy debate. 
Um, and then we, we really want to make sure we introduce you well, because we're just so thrilled to have you joining us today. Welcome, Peter. Uh, I Hi. Just, just before, Hi, Dimitri. Hi, Peter. So before we, uh, we bring you into this conversation, which we're very much looking forward to having, I did want to comment a little bit on the foreign policy debate, uh, which Maria uh, touched on. You know, I, I've been told so many times what the conventional political wisdom is in the course of my, uh, my uh, campaign. One of the conventional pieces of wisdom is that voters don't particularly care about foreign policy. I think that that doesn't actually reflect uh, what we saw last night. What we saw last night was uh, really a high level of engagement from people around the country. I've seen a huge amount of commentary on the discussion. And what I've come to believe more strongly than ever in the course of the seven months of campaigning is that people understand more and more uh, to a greater degree than they perhaps ever have that what happens outside of the borders of this country uh, is for a variety of reasons. These are things that ought to be of the prof profound concern to all Canadians, not simply because what happens outside of the border of this country is happening to other human beings whose lives are every bit as important as our own, but also because the, 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 the developments, the trends that we're witnessing beyond our borders will ultimately have profound impacts on our own country as well. Uh, and I think people understand that. They understand that more than ever. The pandemic has heightened that sensitivity uh, to an unprecedented degree. And so I think this has opened up a space for us to have a conversation about, you know, what is happening internationally, how that impacts all of us, how we are all in this together, and the primordial importance of international cooperation, solidarity, and peace to the resolution of the climate emergency. So for me, I was very, very heartened by the level of engagement in last night's discussion. And I hope that uh, we all learn from it, I certainly did, and that this will be the beginning of a, a larger conversation in the Green Party and beyond about the importance of international affairs to our collective well-being. Yeah, absolutely. Because we, I mean, and, and I think it's important to say too that while, while this is something that, that we're experiencing collectively, this is a profound collective moment, it is important to recognize that we're not all experiencing this equally that those deep inequities, and this is what we're continuing to see as a result of COVID, that the deeply entrenched inequities are actually playing themselves out are more visible than ever. Um, you know, and, and, and that's something I wanna, I have a question about that a little bit later for, for Peter as well, but let me please um, introduce Peter to our audience. And I am gonna read the long bio because I think it's very important for people to, to kind of recognize Peter. Um, you know, where you're coming from here. Uh, what, and of course my, there it is, my, <laughs> pulling up my bio. Um, Peter, you are an ecological economist. You've worked on environmental and ecological issues for over 40 years as an academic, a consultant and public servant. Um, you are professor emeritus at York University. You're also the first economist to apply the physical law of conservation of matter to the empirical analysis of a national economy. Uh, you've been the Dean of Environmental Science at York. You've served as Assistant Deputy Minister of the Environmental Science, um, Sciences and Standards Division in the Ontario Ministry of the Environment. From 2000 to 2004, you were President of the Royal Canadian Institute for the Advancement of Science. From 2004 to 2006, the Chair of Environment Canada's Science and Technology Advisory Board founding president of the Canadian Society of Ecological Economics, chair of the Ontario Greenbelt Council, member of the board for the David Suzuki Foundation, the New Economics Institute, the Center for the Advancement of a Steady State Economy, and the author of Managing Without Growth and Slower by Design, Not Disaster. So we're very grateful that you've agreed to join us in a conversation about ways we can reimagine current systems, focusing today our conversation on our economic system and paradigms. And the campaign team is also, was absolutely thrilled that you, that this campaign has received your endorsement. You've endorsed Dimitri's candidacy. And I wanna take a moment to share with our audience as we head into the final weeks of the campaign for the leadership of the Green Party, um, what you said in your endorsement, which you said that Dimitri's appreciation of the intimate relationship between the economy and the environment is extraordinary. No longer should Canadians suffer with the mindless pursuit of economic growth. 
Dimitri's emphasis on improving well-being through better public services, workers' rights, justice, and police reform, animal welfare, and a more equitable distribution of income and wealth while protecting the environment offers a much better future. His understanding of Canada's proper place in the world, free of the dictates and whims of the USA, is a breath of fresh air. Dimitri has the vision and capacity to take the Green Party of Canada in a new direction, if only we are smart enough to give him the chance to lead. So we're thrilled to have that endorsement, um, especially, I guess, in light, of, in light of your work and the vision of your work, is, which is that we actually begin to, again, reimagine. I think that that's something that we share in this conversation is that we're all quite eager to create a new world and create a new system. We, we recognize that, that it's not working. Um, so I wanna start us off with, the, with, with a question. Um, and then Dimitri and I are going to take turns. Um, so last September, and this, this is really important to me because my work is focused on climate change education and it really stems from my deep concern for young people and their mental health in the context of the ecological crisis. Last September, Greta Thunberg addressed the United Nations and said the following, we are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? So I increasingly see young people refusing the paradigms of extraction and progress that have been offered to them. They're anxious, they're concerned, and at times despairing. Your work paints a much more hopeful and imaginative possibility for the future by disrupting these current narratives of endless growth. I'd like you to take a moment to explain some of the key dimensions of this vision of degrowth for our audience today. Well, look, thank you for that long introduction. <laughs> um, the sobering thought for me as you read it out was actually it's now gone to 50 years, not 40 years. So. <laughs> At <laughs> some point it'll, it'll stop, but uh, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been exciting and interesting. Um, degrowth has a number of different meanings. Uh, I think the best way to understand it is a critical stance towards the pursuit of economic growth as conventionally defined. Uh, sometimes it's used more narrowly than that to mean a, um, a deliberate attempt to con contract the economy as if that was an end in itself. And I think that's a mistake. So I align in some ways with the degrowth community, which is largely based in Europe, but not entirely, uh, because they and I both are, are critics of the pursuit of growth, if you like, for its own sake. Um, it, it, like a lot of these issues, they become quite complicated um, because if we think about GDP, it's not actually a physical measure, first and foremost. It's measured in, in money terms. And this allows those who believe that it can grow forever to say, well, you know, it's really not a physical measure at all. It's just about economic value. And then you get my side of the argument and those of others like myself who say, but you just don't add value you have to have you have to add value to something we add value to the resources that we extract from nature and if we're going to have growth in the conventional terms it's virtually impossible to imagine that we're not also going to have physical growth and the physical growth is what's causing the problems you've already mentioned the climate change problem that we have to keep fueling this e economic growth and up to now we've relied heavily we still rely very heavily on fossil fuels to provide the energy and uh, as you know you, you burn the fossil fuels you release the co2 and it accumulates in the atmosphere and we're getting into serious problems with that so degrowth is if you like an, 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 an attempt to to chart a, a different course which isn't one predicated on the pursuit of economic growth as if that's going to answer all our problems. Peter, I, I, just follow up on Maria's question. And, and first of all, let me say I'm truly honored uh, to have your endorsement. And uh, I've, uh, I've, I've begun to immerse myself in your writings. And the more I, I, I read, the more I want to have a long conversation with you and just pepper you with questions. There's so many, about, okay. so many aspects of it that's intriguing to me. Uh, but I want to start with a big picture question because it's one that has dominated the political uh, debate within uh, this, this wonderful leadership contest. And that is this notion of fiscal conservatism. Like degrowth, that could mean various things to various people. But what 
what seems to be sort of at the core of the notion of fiscal conservatism within the debate that's happening in this leadership contest is the notion of prioritizing a balanced budget. And I'd like, I was wondering if you might be able to comment on that. What are, what are your views about the degree to which we should uh, seek to balance the budget in the current uh, circumstances we find ourselves in, particularly from an environmental and climate perspective? First of all, I'm not a believer in a balanced budget for government. Um, the mistake that some people make is to think of a government's budget in the same way as they think of a household budget. And with a household budget, you have to think about what your income is and how you're going to get by without going into debt. And when you get too heavily into debt, that's a problem. And that doesn't apply in the same way, particularly to a federal government, which has a control over the currency. By the way, this has all been brought to light very effectively by a, a recent book by Stephanie Kelton called The Deficit Myth. And anyone who is fixated on the deficit and getting rid of it should read that book um, because she puts uh, the case very, very clearly. Now, it takes us several hundred pages. I'm only going to speak for a few minutes uh, a, a, about this. But basically, the argument is that um, governments do not have to tax and borrow to finance all their, their expenditures because they also control the money supply. They own the central bank. The bank can create money, as it's been doing for a very long time, and particularly in this uh, situation, uh, simply by keystrokes on a computer and adding to the reserves. And the other part of the uh, story, which is one actually she doesn't pursue in that book, which is a bit disappointing for me, but the, the commercial banks also have the capacity to create money. So when somebody goes into the bank to borrow money, they're not borrowing somebody else's savings. They, the, the bank simply extends a loan if they believe that the loan will be repaid or that the, the borrower has the potential to repay the loan. So the whole question of, of what money is, where does money come from? Fortunately, these issues ha have now surfaced. I have to say, um, I was trained as an economist, a PhD and all of that at UBC many years ago, and um, money was regarded as what we called a veil. You had the real economy, and this veil kind of sat upon it and didn't really get much attention. Money and banking was an elective. It wasn't even central to our study. So a lot of economists, um, I think, don't have an adequate appreciation of money and debt in in the economy. Now, there's this term that's beginning to get a lot of notice called modern money theory, which has overturned a lot of the conventional thinking. And I think the experience of the pandemic, as you mentioned, um, really just gives evidence to show that money can be found when it's required. Now, let me just add one final comment. That doesn't mean that governments can just spend, spend, spend as if there's no limit. The limit is, a, is the limit on what the economy is capable of producing at any time. And if you overspend, you put so much money into, into circulation beyond what can be produced, then you get inflation. But uh, that's, that's, that's the main concern. Well, we haven't had serious inflation, I don't know, for two decades at least, I, I, it's maybe more. Um, so that's obviously not high on the agenda, and the government's been spending all of this money, and we still don't have inflation. In fact, if anything, a lot of the uh, central banks uh, around the world are worried about deflation. So, uh, you know, there's a whole lot going on here, but, but the, the, the end result is to say there's way too much concern given to the government deficit. Can I have one more point that I want to make? Please. If you divide the economy into the public sector, and everybody else, we'll call them the private sector, and that includes trade. If the government borrows, it's because everybody else is lending. They're lending from their savings. If the government balances its budget, then it's impossible for everybody else to save. The two are opposite sides of the same coin, in fact. And so that's why I and others subscribe to this modern money theory um, believe that it's important to have a government running a, a modest deficit because that allows the private sector to save. It's quite interesting. All these ideas are really in the air now and need to be grabbed and worked with. And we're actually having a conversation about modern money theory in the Green Party of Canada race, which for me is very 
encouraging. I just want to note for in passing, many people who are watching this may be interested to know that Stephanie Kelton was an advisor to the campaign of Bernie Sanders. Uh, and I, I myself, uh, you know, have uh, devoted a lot of time to understanding. There it is. I highly recommend that book. So if you haven't read it yet, please do. Uh, so Maria, I have so many questions, but I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. I have. I do have a couple that I want to make sure I get in, and then I will. I will leave it to you. Um, I also wanted to just let the audience know that I am posting as we go along just a few links. So I have shared a little more information um, about Dr. Victor, as well as. Uh, one article that I thought was a very good starting point uh, for people if they're interested in these ideas to continue uh, to, to look into them. And there's a lot about, there's a lot of his work online. Um, so I really encourage people to check it out. So as I was uh, diving into your work, it, it describes our current crises. So, you know, uh, the, the, the crises of inequality as well as the environmental crises that we're facing as of course, many of us know, very complex and interrelated. Um, and your responses to, and that our responses to issues like climate change have to address the separate systems of economics, financial systems, which, which you separate. And I, I, I would love you to touch upon that in a moment once I finish my question about you know, the difference between economic and financial system. I think that's a really important idea for people to understand as well as our ecological systems. So as we respond to these crises, we've got to address issues in each of these systems, but also recognize that they are quite interconnected um, and address the interrelationships between them. So through this understanding that you've, you've gained about the interrelationships, you've developed the theory of ecological macroeconomics. So I'd love for you to share a little bit more about this framework. It's a conceptual framework to help us think about uh, e economics in a new way, um, but also describe how your ecolog different ecological understandings and wisdom, including indigenous knowledge systems, might have informed your understanding. I'm curious to see sort of where your thinking, some of your thinking may have come from hmm. in developing that theory. Well, that's a, a, a big, big question there. I, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. In terms of my own thinking, I have to go back, of course, my own personal story. I was a, a student at, at UBC. I came over from Britain to do my graduate work at UBC in the 60s when the um, space race was on. And we were, the, we were, if you like, the first uh, generation to see an image of the Earth from outer space. And it's now widely known. But at the time, you know, the first time we saw that, the first time I saw that, it made a, made a huge impact on me because I, as an eco economic student, I said, well, where's the economy in all that? And, that's a, that's, and the term Spaceship Earth was coined, and there was a brilliant article written by Kenneth Boulding called The Economics of the Coming Spaceship Earth. And that really influenced my thinking because I began to appreciate that the economy is a subsystem of the planet, a subsystem of the biosphere, as we're inclined to say. What that means is that all of the materials and energy that are used in the economy to make the things that we do, to power the machines, to move us around, um, come from our surroundings. All but the solar energy is on board, it's on the planet. Um, and so you mentioned the introduction. I applied the uh, first law of thermodynamics to um, to the economy. All that meant was um, recognizing that all of the materials that we extract from the biosphere and use in the economy does one of two things. It stays with us for a while in our buildings, our roads, our consumer durables, and then it gets thrown back into the environment. And material doesn't get created or destroyed in that process. It just gets transformed. Now, when the economy was small in relation to the planet, when the human presence on the planet was small in relation to the, to the planet, um, in a way you could disregard those linkages between economic activity and the planet. But by the, by the 60s, certainly, one might say even before, but by the 60s, it was already, we, humans were already a significant mover of materials and user of energy and generators of waste. And what has happened since then, to now 
is that in those days, we were more concerned with what you might call local environmental issues, L urban air quality, urban water quality, uh, local solid waste disposal, very important problems, um, which in many parts of the world have been addressed to a fair degree. But the problems got bigger. And now we talk about planetary boundaries. We talk about global climate change, depletion of the ozone layer, uh, the sixth extinction. I mean, these are planetary wide phenomena. And it all comes about, in my view, because the human economy has been placing increasing, ever increasing demands on the biosphere to support it. So um, that's sort of the origin of my thinking. In terms, you mentioned indigenous people. I've had the opportunity to have some conversations with indigenous people, um, and you get hmm, you get a very different sense of how people are connected to the environment. We tend to, in our, if I can generalize a bit, in in our culture, try always to separate ourselves from the environment. Look at the three of us sitting in nice rooms somewhere, electronically communicating. Um, it, it's a very, you know, in some ways, a very strange way to be. Uh, and, it, and, it, and if you don't think about it, you can begin to persuade yourself that we've cut ourselves off from nature. And isn't that a good thing? Because now we don't have to worry about changes in temperature, we've got temperature and all those sorts of things. Well, indigenous people don't, don't, talk in those terms they don't their ideology doesn't work in those terms as as you may know better than i do so that i think has had an influence on me as as i strive with others to find alternative futures other than more of the same so i guess if i could just stop there for a moment let you have another go or if i've missed something out or something you want to follow up or if i haven't answered at all let me know i i would very helpful. Go ahead, Dimitri. I, I would very much like to ask you a question, which may be uh, quite disconnected from the question Marie asked, but I'm very intrigued by it. Um, and I'm going to quote from you a paragraph from an article you wrote uh, fairly recently. Consumption is one of the main driving forces of the economy. In a successful economy not geared to growth, we would expect the pattern and level of consumption to be very different from a growing economy. For example, well-being would be enhanced with a greater emphasis on public goods which includes the environment on shared provision of private goods, as we are already seeing with cars and bicycles in many cities and on services rather than commodities. And then this sentence, more controls on the content and placement of advertising would be helpful. That sentence really stood out for me because I've got a bee in my bonnet about <laughs> corporate advertising. Uh, I think advertising is in fact a bit of a misnomer and a euphemism, I think a more accurate uh, term would be corporate propaganda. And, and it is ubiquitous in our society. There's hardly a place you can go or a thing you can do without being bombarded with what we call advertising. If you sit in a cinema where you're pretty much a captive audience waiting for the movie to start, they're hitting you with advertising. You've paid for the privilege of sitting in that seat. Uh, when you're on the subway, when you're in the bus, when you're driving down the 401 or some other highway in Canada and you see the billboards, uh, you know, of course, when you're walking in urban centers, uh, it's everywhere on television, radio. And I, you know, there's this underlying supposition uh, that, uh, that, you know, consume, what we call consumers, which I think is a dehumanizing term, human beings who are making decisions about consumption, that they're making that, those decisions generally in our society on the basis of full information, interacting freely with with uh, all the facts that they need to make decisions that are in their own interest. But I think that the reality is quite to the contrary in that as a mat, as beca because of this constant relentless bombardment of corporate, what I call propaganda, people are oftentimes making decisions which are contrary to their own interests, purchasing decisions, and contrary to the interests of their own families, contrary to the interests of their society and the planet as a whole. And so one of the conversations which I want to generate in this contest and going forward whatever may happen in this particular leadership race is the role that advertising plays uh, in influencing uh, uh, behaviors of citizens in ways that are destructive even of their own interests. Uh, and, and I think that that's a conversation that's not even being touched upon by the political class in this country. So what is, how much advertising should we allow? Where should we allow it to occur? What controls are we going to place upon the content and nature of that advertising? What is subliminal seduction? 
in what ways is it being used in order to influence the behavior of our citizens in destructive ways? That is a conversation I think is absolutely vital to have. And I'm just curious what you meant. I, I would like to ask you to flesh out what you meant in that very intriguing sentence at the end of the paragraph that uh, I read back to you. Right. Well, you know, some sentences are designed to provoke thinking in others because you've kind of run out of what you can say about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I seem to have succeeded. Um, <laughs> so I can add something um, because I share almost to a letter exactly what you said about advertising. By way of some background, you made, a, you made the comment that um, we tend to think people make free choices and, and, uh, and we know what's best for ourselves. And that is a fundamental assumption of mainstream economics, who, who see generally no, no role, nefarious role of, of advertising, but you just have to live in this culture to, to think that, that that can't be right. Um, what, so I've, I, some of the observations I would make about advertising as follows. One is, it's quite common for an ad to tell you you have a problem. Uh, and that the solution to the problem is to buy something, happens to be the thing they're selling. Uh, so uh, if, if, if you're lonely, uh, buy beer, because we'll show you images of really happy people having a wonderful time. They don't actually get to drink the beer, because that we've, we don't allow. They hold it, they hold it though, it's the magic of the beer. Um, but that's just one of, of, of numerous examples where advertising, I think, deliberately makes us feel dissatisfied. It's designed to do that. And then to say, now you've got a problem, we can solve it, you buy this product. But it's never good enough. So that I think is, is hugely problematic. Um, so are there, you know, there are, I, first, first of all, I think one of the things that we could learn in Canada is from experiences in other countries where there are stricter controls on advertising. It's not my area of expertise, but I gather in Sweden, for example, they, they, they virtually disallow advertising to children, just not, not at all. It's not a question of controlling it, it's just eliminating it. That's the sort of thing that, that I think sounds very promising. Um, I think that, by the way, advertising has now got, it's got extremely clever uh, with all the get information that's gathered th through our use of the internet and then used to advertise back to us. It's, it's very, very difficult. And, uh, you know, I use an ad blocker, I don't know, others do as well, but it's, they're, not, they're not perfect. Um, I have thought of one simple rule for, uh, for regulating advertising. That's every product should be displayed at least 75% of the time of the way it's actually used. So if you think of, of car ads, they show us always the car on the open road and they usually have, do not do this, this is a professional driver. So they're, they're not even showing you how you could possibly drive the vehicle, but they show it to you in the best, so they show you cars, well, there used to be a, like a four wheel drive vehicles on a mountaintop, could never actually get there, it was probably dropped by helicopter right. for a photo. I mean, it's just terrible, right. terrible. And they're important. always in green environments. They're always, always. Sort of, even though they're green. <laughs> even though that's Ironically. what they, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So if you, if you had a rule which said, no, look, you've got to show the car as it's used 75% of the time, right. then you'd see m most often, uh, traffic jams, congested traffic, you have to show collisions. I mean, it's kind of like honesty in advertising. So I think well, it might, that's just a simple idea, but it might be possible to come up with something a little bit more refined, which restricted the way advertising is offered. Now, you mentioned another thing, which I, I want to tie back to advertising. Um, it's very interesting to compare the ads on US channels with ads on Canadian channels. The US channels are full of ads for uh, medical products, for medicines, mm -hmm. for, but not just medicines, it could be some physical thing as well. Yeah. Whereas in Canada, it, you see a bit of it, but very little. And I believe that's got an awful lot to do with the fact that on the one hand, you've got essentially private medicine, and the whole thing is profit driven. And on the other hand, you have the Canadian system, which is done on very different lines. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a very strong connection, therefore, between the institutional structure that we have for delivering a certain kind of service, and then the way advertising plays into that. So, and the, and the side effects they list, you know, like the very long list of side effects in these ads seem to be worse than the actual, um, you know, symptoms that a person is yeah 
is suffering from. And always, and the thing that's amazing about those ads, I, I'm glad you raised those examples, Peter, because they're so, to me, it's such a stark example of how people are being manipulated. They'll start out by identifying a health issue. Then they will tell you how this pharmaceutical product is going to solve that health issue for you. And wow, don't you feel great? And your life is now better than it's ever been. And at the very end, in about five seconds, some voice will recite to you in lightning speed all the various ways in which this product can kill you. And it comes at you so fast that you can't possibly digest the information. And that, in the United States, is what they call truth in advertising in the pharmacy. Yeah. And the small print. Yes, exactly. Try reading that small print. Which no human being could read that quickly. <laughs> well, actually, I, I did want to share as well, Peter, um, something really struck me when you were talking about uh, the differences in advertising in other countries. Last year, um, around this time, um, in, in August, I was in Denmark. And I remember uh, we were driving from Copenhagen to a smaller town. And I, I had this feeling like something, why do I, I felt calm, like on the highway. I felt this calmness that I don't often feel when I'm driving on the highway or on major streets like going or major arteries leading from out of um, a, a big city and then i realized that that they've actually banned a lot of advertising on streets and on highways mm. and it, it was this moment where i had this palpable sense of this connection between our environment and well-being right? That, that the bombardment of that advertising. Yeah. Something that I've done as a teacher, which came from ad busters, was I would do this activity with students where I had them, um, they sort of timed themselves and they had to recite all of the plants and flowers that they could off the top of their heads without a, a, a 10 second pause. Um, and once they got to 10 seconds where they, as their group could no longer name it, they were finished. And usually that activity wrapped up within 10 minutes. Well, actually, I'll be honest, it usually wrapped up within about five minutes. And then I did the same thing and I asked them to, to list all of the name brands without a 10 second pause. Mm -hmm. And every single time I had to stop the students that we never, we never ran out. And we, it, we unpacked this conversation about that, about what does that mean? And, and the students just had this, you know, their eyes were like this. This is a moment as a teacher that we know when the, you know, when the students' eyes are like, whoa, mm. like, wow, realizing how the, the separation as well from nature that has happened. I think that's kind of one of the core ideas in this is, is how we've been removed that growth, this, I, this focus on economic growth at all costs has absolutely devastated the environment and our relationship to it. And that's mm -hmm. the tragedy that we're confronting now because it's no longer supporting our shenanigans, you know? It's no longer, it's saying, I'm sorry, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm exhausted. So where I think this leads is away from the phrase that Margaret Thatcher made famous, which was, there is no alternative, the Tina principle. In other words, this is, this is what we're stuck with. It's, it's a version of capitalism, it could be worse, maybe it could be better, but this is it. And we can maybe tinker at the edges. And I think that is such a mind numbing uh, phrase and a, a, did us a terrible disservice. So what I've been working on, I guess for the last couple of decades is looking at alternative economic futures and got my hands dirty with um, simulation modeling. Uh, so I developed on two rather different occasions, models of the Canadian economy, which allow myself and anybody else who wishes to, to go online and, and play with the model to, to explore different futures for this country. And one is, broadly speaking, what happens if you just carry on a business as usual case. A second one is, well, let's take climate seriously and really go after that. And then the third is more comprehensive. It says, yes, climate's very important. We've just certainly got to deal with that. But there are a whole range of other things, such as the ones that have come up in our discussion so far, uh, inequality, debt. Um, uh, well, I also include time spent at work and things of that sort, uh, because I think if we could spend less time at work, we might have more fun in our lives and so on. Um, and the results are really quite, quite interesting. And, you know, I, one of the reasons I quite... Um, 
excited to be able to endorse Dimitri is because I see the potential for the sorts of work that I do and others like me do, which is, yeah, we can do the, if you like, this, the technical work, we can do the exploratory work, quite imagined him in its own way, but it takes a, a different kind of person, a different sort of set of skills, a way of doing things to go beyond that into the policy world and to be effective in the, in the political world. So there's a nice, um, I hope, connection uh, being made here because uh, I think academics, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody else, um, fall short very often in in taking ideas out into the into the public domain. Partly, we you know we 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 uh, invent our own terminology. We work with abstract concepts that we find difficult to explain. And that's sometimes an indication that we haven't fully understood them, I have to say. But anyway, it's a, it's a whole mishmash of stuff that's very hard to then package in a suitable way for a, a, broader, a broader audience. So this is, this is what I'm hoping will come out of this discussion and maybe other discussions that we'll have. I would add that uh, the political class uh, bears a considerable amount of responsibility for that failure to incorporate the knowledge of uh, you know extraordinary academics uh, like yourself into public policy making. So uh, I think it's very, very important for those of us who are running today and who are really uh, committed to the transformational changes we need to open up a space for people like you, Peter, uh, to, to give your wonderful research and your thinking and your ideas uh, uh, prominence within our policy making okay. and engage you as fully as possible in that discussion. And I think, uh, you know, I, 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 again, I, want, I can't stress enough how much richness there is in the stuff you've written. I want to, I want to touch on another thing that I read that uh, had a big, uh, made a big impression on me. You wrote that there are numerous business corporations owned all or in part by their employees. Millions belong to cooperatives and there has been a proliferation of social enterprises. A common theme of all of these institutional initiatives is that they are not just run, uh, uh, they are not run just or at all for profit. Hence they do not drive nor are they dependent on economic growth for their success. In a successful non-growing economy, these and other novel institutional forms will thrive. Um, tell us about worker cooperatives. Why are they important? What And what can we as a government do to facilitate the formation of worker cooperatives mm. in society? Oh, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I have much of an answer for you on that. It's another one of these sentences, which I thought led on to some creative thinking of others. I was quite influenced by a book by Gar Alperovitz. I don't know if you know Gar, an American. And I, he, he has in his book somewhere, and his American writes in the US, but 135 million Americans belong to a co-op of one sort or another. Mm -hmm. I thought that's who would have believed that? That's that's remarkable. But when you understand it, credit unions are co-ops, for example. So uh, it includes lots of things which aren't called co-ops. Now, when you ask about worker cooperatives, um, one, one aspect of workers' cooperatives which disturbs me, and I don't know a way around this, is that it's sometimes when businesses fail, <laughs> that then the workers get to take over if that opportunity is given them. Well, it's always tough to start with a failing business and to build that into something good. So really what we need to do is to find a way of creating more workers cooperatives, which don't start out uh, uh, on the back foot, if you, if you see what I mean. Now, whether, and you're a lawyer, you might know this better than I do, whether there are changes to the law that would make it easier for workers to own their their facilities um, that uh, that I wouldn't know, but probably there are opportunities. But something else comes to mind here. This uh, pandemic has changed the way we work and the way we think about work in quite significant ways. You uh, you hear more and more, of course, people working at home. And one of the thoughts that's crossed my mind, I've never actually discussed it with anybody, is if an employer has an employee he's working at home, will the employer pay the employee for the rental of the space at home that's now being used for work? I mean, there's a great incentive for employers who can get their employees to work at home at the, work, at the worker's own expense and save on all of those business costs. But what comes back to the employee 
-hmm. Now, that some might say, oh, well, we'll let the market sort that out. Well, I don't think that's the best that we can do. I think that um, there may be some way of, of uh, obliging employers to pay the worker for the workspace. Now, why is this interesting? If you go back to the history of, of factories, before you had factories and you had, if you like craftsmen, well, they were mostly men, um, they owned their tools. They, they were modest, of course. The blacksmith owned the blacksmith tools and so on. With, with the factories, the workers no longer owned anything except their labor. So the ownership of the means of production, to use that phrase, um, went to the owners of capital. And then the, the capitalism developed such that the workers only got paid for their labor and everything that's left over went to the owners of everything that was owned. Now, if the work system is changing and now the worker once again owning the computers that they work on, the space that they work with, you kind of wonder, is this going to transform the economic system that we, that we now largely work in? And I think the opportunities are there, but how that will unfold, I just couldn't, I couldn't venture. And just to answer uh, a point you raised earlier, I don't think it's primarily a legal impediment that we're dealing with. It's a, it's a financial and educational uh, issue. We need to enable our, we need to train our workers in the whole notion of uh, owning and operating their own businesses. But more than anything, we need to provide them with the financing necessary for them to acquire the means of production and to operate the means of production to, in, in their mutual self-interest. Uh, so uh, for me, this is an absolutely critical uh, plank of our economic platform and the one that we should be doing everything uh, as, a, as a party, the Green Party of Canada, to promote. You know, um, ju just as an aside, I, I, when students used to study economics, there were various things on their lists, like the history of economic thought, you know, what, the history of uh, economic history, the evolution of economic system, comparative economic systems. It wasn't just the study of capitalism um, and different organizations. So they were study cooperatives. Those have pretty much all been dropped out of the curriculum. So now economic students are being trained incredibly narrowly. They're often very good at mathematics and very good at statistical analysis, but the knowledge of the society and the economic system, plus its links to the biosphere, that are absolutely fundamental to understanding what we're facing and how to move forward. It's not there. And e economists, and I, of course, still am one, and some of my best friends are economists, um, <laughs> um, end up often in very powerful positions. And so we've got a real problem with worldview that's being put forward as the norm and the only way to go. It's a big, big obstacle, and um, I try to do my bit with others to right. tackle, eat away at this, but yeah, there's much more to be and, done. And, and that's why educators like you and Maria are so absolutely critical to the well-being of our society, and <laughs> something that we have not uh, appreciated as much as we ought to have in recent years. Uh, so I, I don't want to dominate the conversation, Maria. I know that there were other things that you wanted to ask, Peter. I have so many other questions I could ask. No, I mean, I, I, I don't either. I, I think actually, um, I have a question for both of you, if I, if I may. Um, so someone who has had a profound impact on my own understanding of economics is Marilyn Waring. Um, in both the 1995 NFB film and a more recent TED talk on the unpaid work that GDP ignores, she very effectively critiques the calculus by which we measure economic growth and prosperity and the way in which unpaid labor is normalized by current metrics. Um, there's also conversations happening right now around creating an economics that centers care. So again, re like really rethinking our paradigms of economics and what we measure and why we measure what we measure. Um, additionally, I want to say that I was really moved by an, an, a, an essay recently in the Toronto Star by author and poet Dion Brand, who wrote about this recovery from COVID. Um, and, and she eloquently said, those in power keep invoking the normal, as in when we get back to normal. And she writes, I've developed an aversion to the word normal. Was the violence against women normal? 
was the anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism normal? Were homophobia and transphobia normal? When we're thinking about moving beyond the before time <laughs> into <laughs> something new, that COVID is, you know, as Arundhati Roy discusses, a pandemic is a portal. What concrete policies do you think are needed to create a very different normal that centers care, justice, and regeneration of land? Uh, who would you like to go first? Whoever, whoever wants to take it first. <laughs> I'm going to defer to Peter on this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, I'll start. I mean, it's a, again, it, like so many of the other questions that have come up, we could spend an enormous amount of time on them. Um, GDP, gross domestic product, has so many things wrong with it, if you wish to interpret it as a measure of well-being, that it shouldn't be given any, any credence for that. It's a measure of, if you like, market activity, a measure of purchases and sales. And by the way, it only, only includes those, what we call final purchases. So it includes, if you buy a loaf of bread in the store, that's in GDP, but when the baker bought the flour, uh, that, that's not counted in GDP. That's already included in the price of the bread. So, so it's the final purchases. Um, it happens to be equal to income because you spend out of income. So there are different ways of measuring it. Now, when Marilyn Waring, uh, Waring quite correctly says, uh, not all work is included, she's quite right. Uh, the national income accountants only measure work that is paid for. They're quite clear on what they are measuring. And if you go back to the founders of the measure of GDP, um, Simon Kuznets was the American in the 30s who said before the Senate of the US, do not use this as a measure of how well you're doing. Well, that, that kind of got ignored. So we've got so, to do exactly that. I mean, right? yeah. <laughs> so if you want to estimate the tax base of the society, GDP could be quite useful. But if you want to, to use it to say how we're doing, how the well-being, uh, we've, got to, we've got to develop other metrics. So when you were asking, well, what should we do? One of the things, and it's ideas for this have been around a long time, we ought to put aside GDP as a measure of well-being. We should just not use it for that. And we should measure other things. And there are many candidate or um, proposed alternative measures. I do think we lack a really appealing one. Um, that's a, a topic for another day, but, but that would be the, one of the first things that I, I would do. But people say, well, we can't just push it aside until something else has replaced it. And one of the ones that is there, the UN uses it, is the Human Development Index, which includes GDP per person as one of three things. The other is life expectancy and uh, an educational measure. So it's better, but it's not perfect, because it doesn't include the environment, for example. But there's the ecological footprint that we can use, and many, many uh, candidate measures. Um, so I just want to say a bit more about Marilyn Waring. You can interpret what she says in different ways. She's absolutely right in saying that GDP does not adequately reflect the value of all work done in our society. But you could draw from the conclusion, therefore, let's try and estimate what that work would be worth in, in money terms and add it into GDP. I think that would be a huge blunder. It would, it, would, it would reinforce GDP. It would try to fix one of its problems. Uh, but there are many others, such as the distribution of the income, such as the impact on the environment. I don't think the solution is to fix GDP. It's better to leave GDP in its more limited role and to more consciously um, work out how to measure these other things, but not always in money terms. That's a trap to put everything in dollar terms. It's something that economists love to do, but I strongly ad advise against it. It's more misleading than useful. Well, and she's, she does say that too, that she is reluctant around, around doing you know, certain things that should not have a monetary value. And of course, similarly with trying to do that with the environment. I mean, what is an old growth tree actually worth? And once if we start to put that only in monetary terms, we lose all kinds of measures of what that tree provides. But you see, I would say the same for childcare for your own child. You could work out, it's not difficult, what's, what would it cost you to hire someone to care for your child? That doesn't capture the full 
depth of the relationship between parent and child. And so it's just, to me, it demeans that relationship to say, well, you know, for $15 an hour, it could be replaced. And so I, 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 I'm one, I draw the line and I say, the market is already in, intervening in our lives too much. It goes back a bit to the advertising discussion. The answer is not more market or more market um, kind of analysis or more market equivalences. Let's keep the market in its place. It has a useful role to play in any economy, I believe, but we mustn't allow it to dominate uh, our, our thinking or our institutions. And I think I couldn't agree more, Peter. And I think if we allow the market to determine these outcomes, then many members of our society, women in particular, will continue to perform labor that is either undervalued or not valued at all, not compensated at all. And to me, this is a, a perfect example of the absolutely critical role that government has to play in improving the lives of our citizens. We need to establish minimum standards of compensation for all forms of labor, and particularly those that are either being undercompensated or uncompensated entirely within our society, particularly by uh, historically disadvantaged groups like women. And uh, unless we do that and we rely upon the market to fairly can't value their labor, this injustice will continue. There will continue to be many members of our society who are being undercompensated or not compensated at all. And, you know, I, I want to try to rehabilitate, uh, you know, in, in any way that I can the notion that government can be a force for good in our society and that uh, without a positive democratic intervention uh, by government, uh, we cannot achieve our objectives in terms of both a socially just society, a healthy and sustainable economy, uh, and a peaceful world. If you like, I could just add a couple more comments to Maria's <laughs> very challenging question. Um, because you were asking, well, what, what should we do? One of the people I've been paying a lot of attention to recently is an economist called Herman Daly. I'm actually writing his biography, uh, so I've deeply immersed myself in, in his writings. I've known him for a long time, but, um, and he, he takes the following approach. He says, the first thing you have to do, and he put, puts this in sort of order, you've got to set the scale of your economy in physical terms. We know our economy in physical terms is too big for the biosphere in which it's taking place. Now, that's gonna mean more shrinkage in some places and other than maybe some expansion in poorer parts of the world. But in the rich countries, we've over, overused our fair share of the limited biosphere. The second thing is we have to look at the institutions that are concerned with distribution, exactly what Dimitri was talking about now, which means setting limits on uh, not just minimum income, but maximum income. And the same with wealth, not perhaps minimum wealth, but maximum wealth. Then once you've got distribution, or partly the same process, but you have distribution sorted out, then the market can be quite useful for working out what gets bought and sold. So we lack in our society the first two. We lack the first almost completely, the idea that we should try to limit our use of resources and disposal of waste in physical terms. Secondly, we do some things to moderate the inequality of incomes and wealth, but it's, it's not working very well if you look at the trends over the last two or three decades, it's got more unequal. Um, and then we allow the market to do too many things and we don't really control as, as well enough for market power for monopoly control and so on. So there's a huge agenda there, but I think that systematically sets out the sort of scope, helps scope out the range of things that need to be addressed. I'm just gonna add one thing and I'm not gonna delve into the subject because it's such a huge subject. I, another uh, B I have in my bonnet is about monopoly power, something we don't talk about enough in our society. And I hope, Peter, that you and I can have a discussion one day just on that subject alone, because I think it's so absolutely critical for us to have it. Uh, but I think we're nearing the end of our uh, our session this evening. Maria. Uh, wow, maybe that went you... very fast. <laughs> it did. <laughs> It went very fast. Wow. Um, maybe we can we could squeeze in one one sure. last question, Dimitri. If you have one for Peter, if uh, you know folks, you know if they if they need to go, I will post the um, the website for you, Dimitri. If they want to check out more about um, your your candidacy, if you're an existing Green Party member at this point in time, and um, they can learn more about you. But let's Thank do you. one more question to wrap it up. 
Uh, if that's so, okay with Peter, I should ask yeah. first. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's it's a it's an interesting theoretical question, which hopefully won't take too much time for you to respond to in a meaningful way. There's been a lot of talk in our leadership uh, campaign or contest about the the circular economy. Mm. Uh, there's also been a lot of talk about capitalism, mm. and I'm interested in your thoughts. Understanding that this is not something you could perhaps answer within the space of a minute, please take your time, as much as you'd like. Is is what what do you conceive a circular economy to be, and do you think it's possible to have a system that uh, an economic system that could reasonably describe as capitalist and circular at the same time? Okay, well, um, yeah, I, I can say something about this. A circular economy refers primarily to the materials that the economy uses. There's a big difference between materials and energy. You can't actually recycle energy. You can use energy more efficiently, but every process that uses energy reduces the capacity of that energy to do further work. That's, uh, that's the second law of thermodynamics from a layperson's point of view. So we can, so energy, we use energy and it flows through the economic system and we use a lot of fossil fuels and there's opportunities which we're all exploring to substitute solar and solar driven energy like wind for fossil fuels. But the energy will simply flow through. It won't be recycled. You can't use it over over again. That's a perpetual motion machine. You can't have it. Materials, it's different. You can actually recycle materials. And we're all used to this with our blue boxes. And some of it goes to the garbage. Or not like blue boxes. But some goes to garbage. Some goes to the blue boxes. Gets recycled. But even there, the material does get degraded. So you can't keep making fine paper out of fine paper, throw it away and make more fine paper, it gets downgraded into lower quality paper and so on. So when it comes to the circular economy, what that really refers to is uh, we take materials in from the environment uh, through mining extraction, uh, we process it, use it, we can use it again several times. Uh, and we can do that, we can do a much better job of that. And some people will include sharing in the so in the, in a circular economy, making goods more durable. All of these things will re help reduce the extent to which we have to take in materials from the biosphere. So that's why when I say we need to limit what we bring in, it will help inspire those other activities. People are ingenious, and it'll be more worthwhile to do it. There's absolutely nothing in what I've said that in any way runs counter to capitalism. Um, it, but it doesn't have to be capitalism. It, 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 so there's no, if, let me give you a, a, an example if I can. We are used to living with a limited amount of land. Canada has a fixed amount of land. We've got lots of it, but it's a fixed amount of land. And in the urban centers, urban land is even more fixed. And it fetches a high price. And that price is used to kind of work out where it's going to be used and so on. Um, what I'm saying is we should be fixing the amount of materials that we bring in. And that will work just like the fixed amount of land. It's not a, it, a, a capitalist economy. If that was the only change we were making, wouldn't wouldn't have a problem with that at all. Some people would object. People who make a lot of money out of extracting more and more minerals from the ground won't like it. But that's a different matter altogether. It doesn't mean that capitalism as an economic system couldn't cope very nicely with that. So it's the same thing by limiting um, emission of greenhouse gases. That's not a threat to capitalism. It's a threat to some people's profits, but not to capitalism as a, as a, as a system. And so do you think, uh, sorry, I have to ask you one more follow-up question. Do you think that the circular economy as you've conceived it is uh, the answer to the problem of unsustainability in and of itself, or do you think we need more? Well, I don't believe any economy can be 100% circular even in materials, mm -hmm. uh, especially a growing economy. You see, you can only circulate materials that you've got in the economy. Well, if you're expanding the economy, you have to get more. So if we've got a problem of getting more, obviously circularity is not going to be the answer. And um, you know, you're not going to get anywhere near 100% circular. You'd have to use prodigious amounts of energy to make that happen. See, that's another thing. When you m use materials over and over again, you you have to use energy to do that. So it's so circular economy is a nice idea. And obviously, it's, it's attracted attention. But in reality, it 
an economy can never be circular in a physical sense. Uh, but it's a nice aspirational goal, and we can make it more circular, and those are good things. And so I've come to the point in my own thinking where when a term like degrowth would be another one, how ugly a term that is in English, but nonetheless, it's attracted <laughs> attention. Young people seem to grab it. They like it because it's, a, oh, it's been described as a missile word or a bomb word. It's because it upsets people. That's why you use it. It makes them sit up and think. Well, there's a lot to be said for that, don't you think? Um, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> so, circular, <laughs> economy, <laughs> circular economy doesn't have that power, but it has, it's less con confrontational, but, but it is inspirational because it makes people think, yeah, maybe we could use resources more carefully. That would be a good thing. So fine, let's work with that for the time being, but it isn't the answer. Wow. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this, this has been a really fascinating conversation. And again, there's, there's so much to unpack about this as we try to really reimagine our economic system. And I think some of the, you know, some of the tensions that have come up just even in the last, um, the last things that you shared is, you know, this tension we have between something hopeful and imaginative and possible but then also this reality that we actually do have to confront and disrupt and that we can't just continue on as we're doing. And, and so both of those things are in operation right now as we try to create you know, a much better world than what's currently facing us. So thank you both. Uh, Dimitri, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to say as well. Only that, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, thank you, Peter, for raising this notion of disruption. I. I, I <laughs> I think disruption in the current state of affairs is absolutely essential, although it, it must always be done in a way that is well-intentioned, designed to stimulate intelligent, thoughtful debate that must be had, but that is not being had. Uh, disruption for disruption's sake is not something that I uh, favor or endorse, but well-calculated, well-intentioned disruption is critical to the resolution of the uh, crises confronting us. So if I could just add a last word to that. Sure, please do. We're into disruption. It's a question of what is going to do this. We're, we're in a pandemic. That is a major disruption. Yeah. So the subtitle of my book is slower by design, not by disaster. So I, I think if anybody's out there thinking we can somehow get on a nice smooth path into the future, that's fantasy. So we have to be masters of the changes that we make, not the victims. And that's what I would push for. Well said. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, there will be a recording available of this. And um, please visit us at Team Dimitri. And if you do have questions that you wanted to ask us follow up, there is some contact information on that site as well. And we hope you check out Dr. Peter Victor's work. Have a okay. great Friday sure. evening and go Raptors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. Bye. bye.